Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Abby Gondek. I'm the Morgenthau Scholar in Residence at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this session, which is titled American Responses, USHMM Resources and the JDC Archives. This is part of our 2021 conference, Examining American Responses to the Holocaust, Digital Possibilities, hosted by the Roosevelt Institute and the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. This session is is being um, recorded and it'll be accessible afterwards on the FDR Library's YouTube account. Um, I wanted to go over the code of conduct for the conference. First, dialogue should be civil, respectful, and focused on Holocaust studies and digital humanities. Personal attacks, profanity, or hate speech will not be tolerated and violators will be blocked. And finally, any links or content not directly related to the conference will be removed. Our session today is being moderated by Avi Noam Pat, and I will let him take over from here. Great, thank you so much, Abby, and thank you for all the, uh, the work that has gone into organizing this conference. It is uh, an honor for me to be able to, honorate this, to, to moderate this session on American Responses, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Resources and Joint Distribution Committee Archives. Uh, by way of introduction, I am the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies and Director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. I'll have the privilege of introducing our speakers today for this session and moderating the roundtable and Q&A discussion. And with that as a reminder, if you have questions that you would like to ask our panelists as we go on through the panel today, please use the Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen, it should be, and I will be sure to ask those questions of our panelists as we continue. In a moment, I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, we will have about 15 to 20 minutes of presentations from two speakers from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Ron Coleman and Zachary Levine, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of presentation by Linda Levy, director of the JDC Global Archives, and then I will introduce our roundtable participants, Jeff Edelstein, Diana Fumado, and Cassandra Laprazoita. So it is uh, an honor for me to be able to first introduce uh, our speakers from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The USHMM National Institute for Holocaust Documentation collects and makes available artifacts, documents, photographs, testimony, film, and recorded sound that bear witness to the Holocaust. The museum is building and making accessible to researchers and the general public the collection of record about the Holocaust, the most comprehensive collection of materials available about the subject. Ron Coleman and Zachary Levine are here with us today to discuss museum holdings that shed light on how the United States government and its citizens responded to news of Nazi persecution and atrocities. Ron Coleman is the chief of the library at USHMM, where he manages a team of librarians that guides researchers in discovering and using the museum's vast collection of archival and published material. He was also a member of the team that developed the museum's exhibit, Americans and the Holocaust. Zachary Levine is the director of archival and curatorial affairs at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Zachary oversees the teams responsible for acquisition of artifacts, personal collections and papers, time-based media and copies of collections from archives around the world, and the archival processing necessary to make them accessible for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. So with that, I will turn the screen over to Ron Coleman and Zachary Levine. Thank you. Hi, everybody. This is Zachary Levine. Uh, for, oops. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Zachary Levine. For some reason, it's using the wrong camera, so I'm going to just mute my camera so you don't just look at my neck. Um, so um, in the National Institute for Holocaust Documentation, we're responsible for the acquisition, organization, preservation, and access to the collection of record of the Holocaust. And I'm going to talk a bit in general terms about um, our collection and a couple of other things today. Um, this work currently means that we're 
Uh, we're, we're currently developing new ways for researchers and others to find, uh, to discover new information about the Holocaust and by extension, expand our knowledge about the Holocaust. My role, as Avi mentioned, is to orchestrate the work of the Museums Act, um, both in Washington area and around the world, as well as the archival team who create and maintain the finding aids and metadata that make it possible for researchers and others to use the, uh, 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 to you and users to conduct research in our collections. Um, in addition to overseeing the work of our archival and curatorial teams, I work with staff across NIHD and the museum to, to develop policies that govern our, collection, our collecting as well as how we process and make discoverable our collections. The next slide, please. You may be familiar with the museum's main building in downtown Washington, D.C., the National Mall. The center, um, but the center of NIHD's work has more recently been a few kilometers away, a few miles away at the David and Fella Chappelle Family Collections Conservation and Research Center in suburban Maryland. And here you can see the exterior of the building, and I think looking into one of our conservation labs. Um, at the, uh, the Chappelle Center, as we call it, we receive, conserve, and store our collections. Here you can get a glimpse into one of our vaults, and in this case, collections. Please. So that's a little bit more op uh, this has a little bit more action. A few images of our conservation laboratories on the top and in the lower right, um, where staff assess and care for materials in the collection, but also provide access to some materials uh, for visiting clips. Um, for the duration of the pandemic, the Chappelle Center has been closed to the public as well largely to staff uh, from essential work, uh, aside from staff who are um, undertaking essential work to care for the collection, serve the needs of the permanent ex in the main museum building and support digitization work, though at a reduced level. Um, uh, that was until a couple of months ago. Access has almost exclusively been possible through our online collection, which includes a portion of digitized documents and copy collections, as well as catalog records for many more objects, documents, and other materials. Next slide, please. Um, so what do we have? Um, uh, I think that there should be a few more bullets. Maybe, maybe they'll come as I speak. There we are, thank you. So what do we have in our collections and how much is available online? We hold over 10,000 document collections and we are digitizing these materials, really a Herculean effort with a significant backlog, but that's not any different from really any other similar institution. We also hold and make available a significant collection of documents copied from archives around the world, um, over 100 million documents available on, the, on, uh, on site at the Chappelle Center, though we're working to make much more of those available online. And these also include a number of documents related to and from the JDC. The library of published material and rare books includes over 128,000 volumes and counting very rapidly. Um, and we collect objects and other collections. Um, the current number is over 22,000 objects. And tens of thousands of photographs in originals and copy collections are also available through our facilities. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. In addition, the document and object collections, uh, to those collections, the museum has a significant collection of time-based media materials, such as oral histories, film and video, and recorded sound. As the above list indicates, we have a substantial number of these materials from other institutions that we copy and with whom we partner to share copies of documents, metadata, and expertise, such as with uh, institutions like the Arrelson Archives, which is, a criti which is critical for our staff and researchers to use for exploring the stories uh, and fate of Holocaust victims and survivors. We also work very closely with Yav Vashem, among many others. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so creating and, ho and holding the collection of record of the Holocaust is a tremendous opportunity for researchers. Um, but the challenge is discovering material and identifying collections between, uh, connections between that material. The pandemic has made this need more salient than ever. In fact, it may have hastened our current work to, uh, um, to ambitiously refine how we do our work. That will, look, um, that will look like more, what you know, when we refine our work and we're undergoing this right now, that will look like more and better metadata and other information um, around collection materials online and in our catalog record. 
It will also include even better information that researchers will be able to uncover with assistance from reference staff in the reading room and through other resources like the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center. Fueling these changes will be a number of changes to our infrastructure, both our technical infrastructure and the processes and policies that, we, that, that govern our work every day. In my area of archival and curatorial affairs, that will mean increasing alignment of the way that we acquire, catalog, and process materials in uh, a way that serves the needs of our users of all stripes anywhere in the world at any time. A crux of this work will be the implementation of a new digital asset management system called the Vault that will greatly expand access to millions of digital materials online, as well as work by, other, uh, by our data team who extract names and other, metadata, and other data from materials in our collections and elsewhere to significantly deepen the stories of the fate of victims and survivors of the Holocaust. So for the future, that will mean greater access to materials from anywhere at any time, and ultimately the ability of researchers to not just research in the collection, but across the collection. Now I wanna hand it over to Ron. Thank you so much, Zach. So Zach provided an excellent overview of the scale of collections that we have at the museum. I'm gonna talk very briefly about some of the uh, types of collections we have that shed light on specifically the topic of this conference, the American responses to the Holocaust. Uh, we tend to think of American response as a singular thing, but America does not speak with a voice, a single voice. The Americans at the time in World War II did not speak with a single voice. There were a variety of responses to news of what was happening in Europe, to the plight of refugees trying to flee to the United States and to the, the needs of survivors after the war. And the museum holds a vast number of collections that might be surprising to some researchers that shed light on this aspect. So I'm gonna talk very briefly, I could easily go for hours about all of the collections that, that, that we have on the subject, but just to very briefly give you an idea of some of the kinds of materials we make available specifically about American responses to the Holocaust. And I'll do that by breaking down in sort of four broad categories of what we have. Uh, first is often what people think of about American responses, um, immigration uh, and refugee matters. The museum has of the more than 10,000 collections, the personal collections that Zach mentioned, at least 700 of them document personal and family immigration efforts. Some of these range from a single postcard from a loved one in Europe trying to get out up to hundreds and hundreds of boxes of an American aid organizations trying to assist refugees. We have more than 900 objects and collections just about the voyage of the MS St. Louis. And we can talk about that if you're interested in, in the Q&A later. And Zach mentioned the, the, the copy collections that we have from other archives. We have some of these copy collections from archives around the world that you would not expect to have materials about American immigration and refugee aid organizations, including the Joint Distribution Committee records, which we have worked with the joint, and we'll talk about later, to acquire from archives around the world. Just to give you an idea of the, the of how the, the sort of the scale and scope of what we have, we do have a number of objects that material that, that people have donated to the museum. This is a, the captain's hat worn by Captain Schroeder ab aboard the MS St. Louis. But these types of material these types of objects that we acquire help to shed light on the material culture of what refugees brought with them, what they valued, what they were able to smuggle out, and what uh, uh, objects hold meaning for the life that they had to leave behind. We also have material about American eyewitnesses, and this may be surprising to some people. Um, the material, we have personal collections including home movies of Americans who were in Europe to uh, who captured what they saw and wrote back and shared their, the, the, their, um, what they had witnessed with their friends and family back home. We have documentation of those who went to Europe to help. We can talk about specific collections if people are interested. As part of the museum's Americans in the Holocaust project related to the exhibit, there's a major history unfolded project, which a uh, crowdsourced press coverage from um, local newspapers across the country. That's available through the museum website. We also have material related to 
what we call the Ritchie boys, immigrant soldiers. Those who came to the United States as young, young men, especially, signed up and then went back to, to help liberate the countries where they came from, in some cases to help uh, liberate their own families. This is a video. Um, I won't show the whole video, but this is a video uh, of a home movie from an American uh, professor who was in Vienna on a sabbatical right at the time of the, the Anschluss and, um, and that summer of 1938. And they witnessed and captured the persecution of, of Jews, the, um, in this case, the uh, boycott of Jewish businesses. This film is entirely available online from home. In fact, later on in the, in the video, you can see the professor's wife um, attempt to enter a Jewish shop and an SA officer prohibit her from doing so. We also have material about government responses. And often when we think of American response to the Holocaust, we think of the government. Certainly the, the FDR library holds a rich uh, collection of resources on this topic. The National Archives has uh, vast holdings as well. But here at the museum, we have the personal papers of key individuals, including the Morgenthau family collection. At the FDR library, they have the Morgenthau diaries, Henry Morgenthau Jr., the uh, treasury secretary of the FDR administration, his personal collection, his uh, records of his daily work are at the FDR library. But at the museum in Washington, we hold the Morgenthau family collection. We also hold the diaries of James McDonald, who was the former um, head of the United uh, League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, who uh, resigned in the 1930s to protest what was what he saw as inaction by, by the West. We also have a number of uh, papers of members of the War Refugee Board, including Josiah Du Bois and Roswell McClellan, and oral histories with key individuals, such as John Paley and Gerhard Rigner. Who, these are all names that you know if you study American responses to the Holocaust. And through our digitized collections, you can actually explore their personal collections, including for the papers of Josiah Du Bois, the drafts of the uh, memo that was sometimes called the on the acquiescence of this government in the murder of the Jews. What you see in front of you is a, a, an early draft of that memo. All of those drafts with all of the handwritten um, um, notes from members of, of Henry Morgenthau's staff can be found on the museum's website. And this is the memo that led directly to the creation of the War Refugee Board. This is just to show how this interface looks online. And we can talk a little bit more later about how you can access these materials from home and what you need to do to come to the museum to access more. And we also have material about the liberation of the camps. About a thousand collections have letters, photographs, and other materials taken by American soldiers who were present at liberation or soon afterwards and wrote home to share the news of what they had seen. We have more than 1,300 oral histories describing liberation, including from survivors and the liberating soldiers themselves. And in the library, we have regimental histories of all of the units that have been recognized as liberators. If you've looked at photos of liberation, you know that they can be pretty graphic. This photo is just to show the presence of American generals uh, uh, at the um, liberation of the Ordruff camp. Ordruff was the first camp that the American soldiers encountered in the spring of 1945. I'll cut it uh, here, uh, uh, look forward to your questions, but just to say, if you're interested in conducting research at the museum, the main source is to go to the museum's website, www.ushmm.org. We do, have, as Zach said, we are accepting um, uh, uh, reservations for researchers on site two days a week. And if you're interested in that, or if you're not even sure where to start, just send us an email at reference at ushmm.org and we'll do what we can do to help. Thank you so much, uh, Ron and Zachary for a fascinating presentation. It's really exciting to hear about these resources and think about the potential for research, for public education, and also for scholarly collaboration, which that's one of the exciting things about this panel too, to have two remarkable institutions in conversation with one another on this program. So it's uh, a privilege for me to be able to welcome uh, Linda Levy from the Joint Distribution Committee to talk about how the JDC archives presents Holocaust-related content. 
For those who do not know, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, or the Joint, or JDC, is the largest Jewish humanitarian organization in the world. Established in 1914, the JDC focused on rescue, relief, and the rehabilitation of Jewish communities following the First World War. JDC was already operating in Europe and elsewhere across the world with the rise of Nazism in 1933. The JDC archives hold the organizational historical records of, Nazi, of JDC from the World War II era, all of which have been digitized and are accessible online. Linda Levy is the executive director of the JDC archives, and under her leadership, the JDC archives digitization program has seen dramatic expansion. Linda, I will, and Jeff, I will hand the screen over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. Um, as you heard from um, Avi Pat, um, even before the rise of Nazism in Germany, JDC had an understanding of the local context in Europe and had established contacts and relationships with Jewish communities and other NGOs on the ground in Europe and elsewhere. This experience proved useful as the JDC became deeply involved in rescue and relief programs before, during, and the Second World War. With its overseas headquarters based in Berlin, JDC had a close vantage point to view the early impacts of the Nazi party on German Jewish life. In 1933, the organization moved its headquarters operations to Paris in, in response to a threat against its office. JDC provided aid during the 30s as the German Jewish community responded to the Nuremberg laws and the restrictions placed on Jews. It assisted with the development and funding of retraining programs as Jews were excluded from certain professions, established more Jewish schools, Jewish children were no longer accepted in public schools, funded welfare the needy and provided emigration assistance. As Jews began to leave Germany and Austria, JDC worked to identify countries refugees either on a temporary or permanent basis. JDC archival records include many lists of people assisted during this period. Um, these lists, which date from the 30s and extend through the Second World War, were often useful in tracing family members. We have here one such list of the St. Louis, the ship, the St. Louis, and the countries to which the 907 stranded passengers were taken after being denied entry into Cuba. JDC provided relief assistance to Polish Jews who were expelled from Germany between 1938 to 39 in the no man's land um, at the border with Poland. A 127 page list with the names of 1,542 refugees assisted in Spanjin and in other no man's land towns is included in our collection and has been indexed in our names index. JDC act activities during this period extended to many countries across Europe, across the globe, as the organizations did what it could to provide succor and to assist Jewish refugees in their quest for refuge. We see here some photos from uh, several different countries. Um, and a poignant telegram from immediately following the war, which was sent from Warsaw to our office in New York, from Luba Mizne from Poland, saying, I live, require help. Following World War II, around 250,000 European Jews who had survived the Holocaust made their way to the displaced persons camps in Germany, Austria, and Italy. These overcrowded and bleak environments provided the barest of necessities, supplementing the relief provided by the US Army, UNRWA, 
and its successor, the International Refugee Organization, JDC provided critical services that nourish both body and soul. We have here a photo of uh, Earl Harrison, who was sent by President Truman to examine the situation for Jews in displaced permanent uh, persons camps in Germany and Austria, and he was accompanied by JDC's Dr. Joseph Schwartz. Next slide. Our, 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 J, our archival documents, uh, our archives documents this important historical period and the work of the joint. We in recent years have worked to make this material online to a variety of potential users. You see here a list of the text collections which have been digitized and are available online. Next slide. And we have the other collections which also are available online. Um, scholars can use our collections database to view all records from this period. Um, the collection is searchable to the document level, and the search can focus on a specific ar archival collection or on the entire collection. The JDC Archives Photograph Collection is rich in photos from this period and, a and is a resource used by many publishers, filmmakers, scholars, and other researchers. We have some examples here of photos. Online finding aids link directly to the digitized file and enable the user to peruse all documents in the folder. Finding aids for the World War II era include records of the JDC in New York, Istanbul, Stockholm, Cyprus, and Jerusalem. The Geneva Collection from 1945 to 54 is of particular note for the immediate post-war period. Of note also is the finding aid for our oral history collection, which includes lengthy oral histories by veteran JDC staff members who were involved in JDC operations during the World War II era. The JDC Archives has created a number of online educational resources website to educate the public on our work during this period. These Activities were established after receiving many requests from children of survivors who were trying to understand the chronology of events, who did what, and who paid for what. As a service to those who were impacted by the Holocaust and to the general interested public, the JDC Archives initiated the following online projects that have drawn great interest. First, we have here a screen page from the opening page screenshot of the opening page of an online exhibit, Everything Possible, JDC and the Children of the Displaced Persons Camp, which is rich in photographic images which illustrate the formation of the DP camps and the various facets of life for children in the DP camps. Next, please. The exhibit includes introductory texts and captions which provide a brief historical background and annotate the folders. Google statistics indicate large numbers of visitors to this online exhibit. It provides an easily accessible interface for educational settings to bring a plethora of engaging photos directly to the classroom. So often world wars become the focus of curriculum but the notion of what happens after, how individuals instead of countries are affected, and how refugees rebuild are important points, all the more relevant as students hear more and more about refugees today. How can humanitarian aid organizations like JDC make a difference? What was their impact? What does involvement look like today? Our website includes an Our Stories page, which, which has features presented by topic, by location, and by decade. 
The user can thereby gain an overview understanding the mission of the organization by these parameters. They utilize the rich photographic collection to illustrate activities around the globe. The Our Story Interactive Timeline provides a map of the world by decade with locations marked where JDC was active. Use of the 1930s and 1940s decades provide a rich global overview in a visual way of the rescue and relief efforts of this humanitarian organization around the world in, a, in response to the rise of Nazism and the emergency crisis during and after World War II. Each photo can be clicked to access captions and further information. Next, our shared legacy was created to provide survivors and their families with a user-friendly resource to search for JDC archive documents and photographs related to their family during the World War II era and to encourage people who were assisted by the joint to share their stories with the JDC. It includes a number of components. First, explore our photo galleries. Users may choose from an alphabetical list of eight countries in which the JDC worked during World War II and access the set of curated photographic galleries drawn from our collection. Um, photo galleries are organized by country and then by location within that country. For example, under Germany, there are 14 different photograph galleries named for places such as Bergen-Belsen DP Camp, Beldefing, Fahrenwald, and many others. Each photo gallery includes photographs from that place and a brief description of JDC's work in that location. The interactive recognize someone feature allows the reader to identify individuals in a photo and to share this information with the joint. Readers can move the cursor to a face in an image and identify the individual. Hundreds of responses have been received from readers identifying family members. Some responses include very touching requests for copies of the photo, as many families do not have photographs of, their, of themselves and their family during this period. The JDC incorporates the historical and genealogical information its metadata for that photo. The photographs themselves provide a wealth of information. Taking one photo, for example, with prompted questions, a student can begin to learn and see exactly what they like in the DP camp. Questions can be used to help analyze the photographs. What do you see? Where do you, where do you think they are? How can you tell? How old are they? What language is that written in? What year is this? How can you tell? Buildings, materials, expressions, clothing, all of these visual stimulators hint at important historical details, which the instructor can then relate once students have been engaged visually and have imagery in their heads. The second major section is share our search our names index the user can enter the name of a family member who have received assistance from the joint and access jdc archival documents on which the family's member's name appears the names index includes today over 600,000 names covers and it includes 110,000 index cards from jdc's Immigration Service in Vienna, Munich, Paris, and Warsaw from the immediate post-war years. It also includes many documents relating to Jewish refugees in Shanghai and in Kobe, Japan. It includes index cards of those assisted in Barcelona and many ship passenger lists such as sailings of the Serpa Pinto. Another significant example is a list of over 9,000 Jewish from Poland who were assisted by the joint in Vilna in 1941. A user may find one or even up to five or six 
in the family members. A list of index lists appears on our website. We call it list of lists. And uh, site visitors can peruse this page to see whether a list that might pertain to their families has been indexed. Um, the names index has been by far the most important and popular feature of the JDC Archives website. Visitors of our site have been very moved upon seeing the name of a family an index card or list. The website provides a brief description of the list and the ability to view or print either the page on which a family's member's name appears or the entire list. Uh, we have here a list of orphans from Buchenwald who JDC assisted arrive in Paris and to be cared for there. Um, and we have on the list a name that says Laser Reason, which actually is a type, has a typo, and has been confirmed to be LED cell. We have heard very touching from the many people who have found names of family members on this list. They have also helped families to fill in gaps in their understanding of their family history. This material has great potential for use with younger people researching their family history. The third feature is Tell Us Your JDC Story. Um, it encourages users to share with us how they were, how their family was assisted by JDC. Could we go back a slide? I think there's a, oh, okay. Uh, users are prompted to answer a number of target, a series of targeted questions, uh, where the person was born, when and how they were helped by JDC, whether they were in a DP camp and which one, if they received immigration assistance from the joint on which ship, and to which country, and is there a particular staff member that they remember? With the permission of the submitter, these narrative stories have sometimes been highlighted in our quarterly e-news and appear on blog posts on our website. Our analysis of, use of user statistics points to a great interest in curated material. Thus, we have devoted efforts to creating five curated topic guides which provide context and detail about the organization's work during World War II. JDC's records of its work in assisting Jewish communities are a treasure trove of primary source material. The original material can be used by educators in a variety of settings to bring historical events and challenges to life in a very meaningful and poignant way. In our topic guides, we seek to introduce the historical event and provide rich primary source material that the educator can utilize to develop lessons, curricula, programs, or readings. Included our original letter reports, minutes of meetings, and historical. I'll give one example, uh, the topic guide on the story of the SS St. Louis. It has consistently been among the top 10 pages of our website since the site's launch in 2012. The St. Louis topic guide includes a brief overview, a clip from a document documentary film produced by the joint about the St. Louis, a link to a commercial film on the topic, and links to PD-19 primary source documents from the JD and several photos. Uh, we have here the letter of thanks written um, in handwriting by uh, Captain Gustav Schroeder, uh, who was the captain of the St. Louis, to Morris Troper of the JDC, thanking him for his assistance in the um, uh, binding uh, countries that would accept all of the passengers um, after Cuba did not accept the people. Topic are geared to a number of different audiences. The full topic guide can be used, or segments of it can be used um, as you know, as uh, the individual uh, would like. Next, JDC's documentary film 
drawn great interest from filmmakers and scholars. A list of digitized films is organized in chronological order and is available on our website. JDC has initiated a for use of its digitized films at no fee to academics for use in the classroom. The film clips can be used as clips or in full film format in public film screenings for a more general audience. Screenings of these film clips that we have sponsored for audiences of scholars, genealogists and family historians, Jewish community groups, and archivists and librarians have elicited a very positive response. One of the newest pages on our website is a, a list of our public program, the recordings of all of our public programs that we've done since 2014. This list is organized by region of the world with the most, um, uh, the, the latest program uh, listed um, first within the region. Um, one can click on the name of the, on the topic of the session and reach a description of the of the of the lecture and of the lecturer and a link to the full list. In conclusion, the digitization of the JDC archives text, photo, and audiovisual collections and the launching of its website provide new opportunities for and about the work of the joint during World War II and its aftermath. Text records from this period are now accessible online for scholars and other researchers uh, to, who are interested in conducting rigorous in the database. The Names Index is a user-friendly resource for laymen to access lists of individuals assisted by the joint. More material is added all the time to the Names Index, so if you've looked once, you should come back and see it again. Our shared legacy provides access to the Names Index, photo galleries, the JDC story feature. Curated materials such as online exhibits and online topic guides are designed to help users access critical information about JDC's role during this period. Films and other audiovisual materials are particularly effective in reaching a younger and more general audience. User statistics thus far indicate significant interest in these curated educational initiatives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, for that fascinating overview of all of the collections at JDC. I'm looking forward to our discussion. I will note as a reminder that uh, we already have one or two questions coming into the Q&A. Please use the Q&A function if you have questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, and we'll get to it at the end of our session. Uh, I'm now pleased to welcome uh, three panelists to join us for the roundtable portion of our, uh, of our program. Uh, Jeff Edelstein is the Manager of Digital Initiatives at the JDC Archives. Uh, Dion Afumado is the Chief of the Holocaust Survivors Victim and Resource Center. And Cassandra Laprade Soita is Collection Curator at USHMM. They'll each give us brief presentations about uh, the work that they do at their respective institutions before we uh, have a Q&A discussion with everyone. Jeff manages the JDC Archives website and collections database and leads the digitization of text collections and names indexing project. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Avi, and um, hi, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this session. Um, I wanted to focus my remarks um, particularly on the question of collaboration um, because uh, the whole workshop is aimed at discussing uh, what digital possibilities there are and uh, collaboration is a big part of that. Um, and uh, in particular, um, given our partners in this specific session, um, JDC and USHMM have had a very valuable relationship that has allowed us to digitize a number of collections uh, that are important for this era. 
uh, USHMM um, through its microfilming projects uh, microfilmed the JDC's uh, post-war overseas office headquarters collection. We call it the Geneva Collection for the period 1945 to 1954. And um, we each have a set of those microfilms. And for our digitization project, the microfilming is a way station along the way from paper to digital. Um, and it's an important preservation medium. So the um, microfilming was a massive effort and it was what enabled us to go forward to digitization and to put all that material online. Another major, major project uh, from the same period uh, from, uh, in terms of history um, that the USHMM had a role in for JDC was our post-war Warsaw office collections. Um, the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw holds that collection. USHMM uh, had microfilmed it and we were able to make an arrangement among the three organizations that JDC could borrow USHMM's set of the microfilm in order to digitize. And again, then that digital collection was integrated completely into our uh, complete online database. So now that collection speaks to our other collections from that time period in a way that it never did before. And it's available to anyone around the world where you used to have to go either to Warsaw or to Washington, D.C. to use that collection on site. So again, these kinds of uh, collaborations uh, make digital projects possible and uh, we wouldn't be able to do the kind of research that we can do now without them. Another kind of collaboration, um, and uh, this takes off on Ron's talk from the morning session, um, USHMM uh, helped to provide funding to preserve one of our historic films. We had already been able to digitize the film, but then um, the, the actual film preservation was supported by USHMM. And now we each have a digital copy of the film. It is um, about the sailing of the ship, the Mugino from Lisbon in 1941. And why it's important to all of us is that it highlights a, a, a historical co collaboration of that time. The American Friends Service Committee um, brought hundreds of orphans from France to Lisbon and then JDC uh, put them on the ship and got them to the West. Uh, so collaborations among NGOs at the time are another interesting um, area of research. We also now that material has been digitized, another sort of sharing that we do um, for those who are interested in genealogy and family history is that once we have indexed uh, lists of material from our text collections, we often share them with relevant uh, other Jewish genealogical organizations, for example, JRI Poland um, and IGRA, the Israel Genealogical Research Association. And I will uh, stop there and we can chat more during the rest of our discussion. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, it's now a pleasure to turn the screen over to Diana Fumato and Cassandra Laprad Soita. Dr. Diana Fumato oversees the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center and their work on research on individuals and on Holocaust related topics and supervises staff uh, providing research services and assistance to a large variety of audiences, which include survivors, families, scholars, educators, federal agencies, museums, documentary filmmakers, the general public and more. Go ahead, Dion. I believe you are muted, Dion. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Avi, um, and thank you, and, every, and hello, everyone. Um, well, uh, what Jeff and Linda said about lists of names and um, and archives and collaboration, I would say that you know what we do in the Resource Center, in the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center, is uh, conducting research about individuals, and that complements what uh, the JDC does as well. And we often refer um, the people that we help to the JDC. 
So um, like you said, Avi, um, the, the resource center conducts research um, about survivors. Uh, we are contacted by survivors also, by second generation scholars, researchers, teachers, um, students, documentary filmmakers, um, TV producers, and also by staff from other museums um, in the US and around the world. And so the, um, the Resource Center staff um, searches all the collections that we have at the museum, starting with the International Tracing Service Digital Archives that you've heard about already. Um, and this collection contains documents uh, regarding all the victims of the Nazis and their collaborators, um, both Jewish and non-Jewish victims, um, Sinti and Roma, political prisoners, etc. cetera. Um, those documents could be um, a large variety variety of documentation. It could be deportation lists, um, prisoners' files, documents from camps and ghettos, um, documents about death marches at the end of the war, grave locations that are very important for people from um, the family members. We also have amazing post-war collections uh, from the Allied occupation zones. Um, those collections are absolutely fascinating for researchers and not very used or they could be actually more used by researchers. Those collections are um, mostly from displaced persons camps, um, both Jewish and non-Jewish DPs, um, immigration after the war. And we also have collections uh, about refugee organizations such as the UNRWA or the IRO that help DPs to be either repatriated or to immigrate. Um, we also checked some um, post-war collections, the post-war trials, um, testimonies of survivors, and um, also children during the Holocaust. So the staff um, searches the digitized uh, and non-digitized collections at the museum um, and any additional resources that we can access uh, on other institutions' website, uh, such as the JDC, but also Yad Vashem or the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris or, Jew or Jewish Gen. And uh, we also uh, very often refer um, people and researchers to um, other institutions. And um, like Linda and Jeff said, the JDC also uh, works closely with the, uh, with the museum and mentions the USHMM on the website. Um, we also have um, the Aerosol archives, like uh, Zachary mentioned, um, who is working closely with us and that mentioned the glossary created by the museum on their website. So just, uh, just to give you a, a scope of it, uh, of the work that we do, uh, a little bit about numbers, but not too much. Um, since the opening of the ITS at the museum in December 2007, we have received more than 40,000 requests uh, about individuals uh, from people, and we answered 97% of them. So uh, behind th those numbers, I really would like you to realize that the research work that we do in the Resource Center is really about individuals. Um, when we look at a digitized, do digitized document on our computer screen, we see a person. It's not just an archival paper or document. It's really about a person. Each document is a piece of a life's puzzle. And sometimes um, we send uh, to family members the only existing photograph of a victim. So this is what we do on a daily basis. And by providing people with the documents about individuals, we contribute to memorializing the fate of those who were persecuted. But this micro history type of research is really part of the macro history. Um, teachers can use those individual stories as case studies to make the overwhelming narrative of the Holocaust more accessible um, to students. So the more we digitize, the, the better it is. And just to give you a very brief example, the photograph of this little girl, Sinaida Grusman, used on this conference program cover um, was published on the USHMM's website as part of a digital project launched in um, 2011 and called the Remember Me Project with a question mark. And we posted more than um, 1,100 uh, photographs of children and we were able to identify about uh, 400 of them. So this, this gives you an idea of uh, the power of researching about individuals and um, and Teaching about the Holocaust is, you know, one thing, and also we contribute to reuniting um, family members, uh, sometimes survivors, but sometimes um, more and more the second generation and the third generation. So um, I will probably try to share a video with you, maybe um, later on or now, if we can, uh, if we can. Well, why don't we 
hold that for now because I want to also give Cassandra sure. a chance to speak, and then we'll, if we have time in the in the Q and A, sure. we'll we'll share that as well. Um, so uh, Cassandra Laprad Soita is a collection curator at USHMM. And she's a member of the acquisitions team working domestically and abroad to identify, research, and acquire personal papers, objects, digital assets, and time-based media for the museum's permanent collection. Go ahead, Cassandra. Thank you, Avi, and thank you other uh, participants and our guests today. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you a little about the collections um, that the USHMM holds. Um, as you've heard, we collect broadly both to document the experiences of victims and survivors, as well as perpetrators, collaborators, aid givers, and other eyewitnesses who appear across these categories. Um, as the NIHD in particular um, works to build the collection of record on the Holocaust and to strengthen that collection. We also aim to fill gaps um, where we have less evidentiary material. And so in our collecting efforts, we can be quite targeted uh, in certain areas where we know that we, we need to strengthen what it is that we already hold, or because there is a museum initiative um, that requires further substantiation, document material to draw on. So the Americans in the Holocaust exhibition that was recently and continues to be exhibited at the museum is one of those areas. Um, so exhibitions can certainly drive that. The interest of our various audiences and, and patrons as well, and the scholarly community, what potentially will allow for new inroads in, in such research. Um, in our own acquisition work, we're very conscientious that uh, additional research has to be conducted where these materials are offered to us because with the passage of time, we are, are facing that insight from the um, the survivor and eyewitness generation who's able to provide us with that doc, uh, firsthand documentation. So certainly um, digitized collections with our in our own holdings, but also in partner institutions are critical for our work. Um, and we also like to participate in this collaboration and exchange of information through the accessibility of our collections. Digitization of personal papers collections that we are acquiring is a priority so that resonant, con uh, pardon me, connections can be made um, by all patrons of our website. We have uh, our website as a platform where uh, any visitor, whether they are a high school student or an advanced scholar can dig further um, into these digitized collections thanks to the uh, intensive cataloging work that happens on the front end through our colleagues um, across the museum. Um, and I would love to delve further into some specific examples of collections that have provided new insight to us. Um, it certainly in recent years, um, at, at some stage in the in the Q and A, um, but we continue to make new discoveries and to help facilitate others find resonant connections. Um, it's certainly very gratifying when those are personal. So we are still having the opportunity to put individuals in touch um, thanks to digitized collections. We had an instance recently um, where a number of young children who survived the Holocaust in Belgium um, were reunited thanks to um, one of the uh, the nursemaids who was in the home uh, in the post-war era and who donated her collection to the museum um, because they were able to identify the locale in our online collection search and to be in touch with her and one another as a consequence. So we recognize that, you know, robust catalog records uh, surrounding collections really make that possible. Um, and so I'm excited to discuss more with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And I see we have a, we have a few questions that have come into the Q&A. We have a, until about 2.30 um, for discussion. So I'm going to start with one broad question uh, for all of you, and then we'll, we'll get into some of the questions that have come into the Q&A as well. Um, but it does, and whoever wants to respond, maybe raise a hand and I'll, I'll know uh, who wants to start. Um, it does strike me that we have an opportunity here. You're all uh, experts, archivists, collections experts, and we can reflect on 
both the vast collections that you have shared with us, but also the digital possibilities that are available in terms of accessing these collections and using them for education and, and research. Um, but at the same time, we're dealing here with a topic in terms of uh, the Holocaust that can seem enormous and overwhelming and collections which are enormous and overwhelming. And yes, digitization does provide certain possibilities and greater possibilities of access to these collections, but it can also seem enormous and overwhelming. And so I'm wondering if you can reflect a little bit on the role of the archivist, the collections expert in how we navigate this period of time where we have access to these remarkable collections, but how do you help researchers? How do you help educators? How do you help the general public sort of figure out how to navigate these these uh, huge collections, right? And and everything seems available, but how do you help them figure out what they should be looking at? Um, so whoever wants to to start or share some of your experiences, go ahead, Linda. Why don't you start? Uh, you're, I think you're muted still, Linda. Very goal to online and in the last year we've actually streamlined the finding aids a bit to make them much more user friendly and one can click uh, a file on the finding aid and get into the database but our finding aids are fairly detailed and they allow a researcher to um, be able to locate the sections of our collections that um, are the most pertinent to the to their research um, and um, I think that digitized material is um, accessible from a distance, but sometimes an archivist can also be of assistance to a researcher who has questions. So I would say that digital material alone is one way to do research, but sometimes uh, conferring with the archivists who may know of additional material or may know um, maybe more experience with how to navigate the digitized material can be that as well. Uh, and can also be helpful with um, other material, not only the text collection, but also, for example, oral histories, also a photo collection, also artifacts, and also other archives that um, can also augment and supplement this material. Really helping to make connections, right, between collections and archives. Zach, I think I saw your, your hand. Thanks. And um, I think Ron can definitely talk a bit more about the, the role of the, the reference folks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are trying to do on our um, acquisitions and archival processing teams. Um, so um, as Linda mentioned, I think uh, streamlining and integrating the various processes for developing finding aids is absolutely critical. And in fact, for a number of our copy collections, we are redoing the ways that we create finding aids um, from uh, the source archives going, you know, reaching all the way to our initial surveys of those archives um, and thinking about how those surveys can actually feed into the needs of our users, both in terms of the users who are going to be accessing these um, finding aids when they're maybe in the reading room or preparing for their research, but also so that they can actually navigate across these finding aids um, for digitized materials once they end up in our um, digital asset management system, which is being rolled out over the next few years. Um, but, but really, this question gets to a much deeper issue, which is how do you discover topics across collections, and especially collections as immense as uh, the types that the, G, the, the JDC and the USHMM have? I mean, we take in, um, just through Cassandra's team, two collections a day, um, and uh, sometimes it's a bit more. On top of that, we often get you know large large amounts of materials from uh, uh, our time-based media team, but also in our copy collection, we take in usually over a million images a year. So being able to parse all of this material and find connections and also find routes for new uh, research across them is a huge challenge. Um, so we you know the, the, the fixing finding aids and starting to integrate this is one way. 
Another way, which is really a very much at the experimental stage, is to actually trying to find interdisciplinary um, approaches that maybe leverage digital humanities um, and machine learning to actually start to pick apart um, parts of these um, of these uh, connect of these collections and actually identify connections across them. So, for example, you know we have one researcher who has come to us who is trying to do facial recognition across our connect our photographic collections to identify the same people in multiple um, uh, photographs. We have another digital uh, humanities scholar that we're working with right now to actually create um, um, various types of uh, uh, semantic learning models that will look across different types, different part, different collections and start to identify connections with the uh, uh, with textual analysis. Um, but we are really at the very, very early stages of this um, in part because at the end of the day, what's really needed beyond just getting this stuff into a digitized state is um, extracting the text and the resource. So um, actually, you know, finding a way to take that information and make it usable, not just make it there. Um, and I could go on and on and on. I'm sure, Jeff, you've also, I see you shaking your head that you're thinking about this all the time. But this is really, you know, the next generation of work for a lot of us. The only thing I'll add to that uh, go ahead, Rob. is that the reference work is a conversation. It's an ongoing conversation between a researcher and the librarian, between a researcher and the collection itself. Um, all of the work that the JDC is doing, that we're doing, that other archives are doing to improve the catalog records, the finding aids, and digitized material is, is improves that conversation. What I found over the years is that we're having, whereas used to be that researchers would come to us with a very sort of basic question. Do you have any material on this topic? They're coming to us with much more sophisticated questions because they've already exhausted the material that they found that's digitized, that they found online, the finding aids. And what's happened is they, have, they haven't answered, they've answered some questions, but those answers have raised other questions. So this is an ongoing conversation um, among all of various disciplines but also a conversation among the collections themselves. Um, Jeff alluded to the, the video from the Mugino. Um, as part of our work with that video, we discovered uh, in a, an entirely separate collection of French records here at the museum, lists of the children aboard that ship with the numbers on their tags. So with that list, we were now able to identify the individual children in that video and in other photographs. This is ongoing work and it, 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 it's, we're right at the vanguard of, of, of tremendous work, as, as Zach has alluded to, but it is an ongoing conversation that we're very excited to be a part of. Thanks, Ron. One of the exciting things about sort of having these two collections in conversation is thinking about the possibilities for the future in terms of the guidance that can be provided by, by archivists, the guidance, the interactive nature of research and the research questions that are asked, but also that this, we might be able to spree, speed up the um, development of knowledge in the future through the types of questions, the indexing that happens. I mean, it's it's exciting to think about um, how that might that might work. Um, I want to bring in some of the questions that that have come in um, from the audience, and I will I will note that um, also in both of your presentations. You also started to allude to the different areas of research that certainly overlap between um, the, the two collections. The St. Louis came up several times as an example where you can sort of see the collections in conversation with one another. Um, Carol Cohen writes in, thank you for this fabulous workshop. I have questions about Eleanor Roosevelt and her efforts to assist refugees. And I would imagine that this might be an area where again, right, there's um, materials in both collections where a question like this can bring them together. So I don't know who wants to start with Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt. If you have something to add, go ahead, Linda, you start and then Ron. You're muted, uh, you're muted Linda. Muting. Muting. Linda, you're muted. Assume that we have less material than the USHMM does, and Ron can, you know, let us know what 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 you have. Um, but our collection does include correspondence um, with Eleanor Roosevelt, who did who who had a particular interest in in helping to rescue children 
Um, she did visit overseas. We have some photos and we have um, some correspondence with Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we, we actually used some of that material in our centennial exhibit in 2014 at the New York Historical Society. I'll say Thank from you. our perspective, um, Eleanor shows up. Uh, she really was the voice of um, of consciousness uh, on her on her husband's shoulder uh, when it came to refugee matters. Um, mm -hmm. And in our collections, she shows up in, in in flashes here and there again in specific correspondence in photographs. Really, the FDR Library is the primary holder of material related to Eleanor Roosevelt and her efforts. Um, just to wrap it back again to the, the image of the children on the on the ship. Those children came to the United States under with the help of the AFSC and the JDC, but under an umbrella organization called the US Committee for the Care of European Children. Eleanor Roosevelt was the prime creator of that organization in 1940. So again, her fingerprints show up in a lot of the collections and a lot of the um, stories that we have, but they may not be obvious in the way that 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 Eleanor's actions led to, to to specific actions and specific events. But really, if you're interested in the subject, the FDR library is the primary source material for this. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, one of the other areas that we see considerable overlap between the collections is is in the post-war um, era and post-war work. And there's a question here that comes in from Daphna about asking very specifically, was there a JDC office in Frankfurt between 1945 and 47, wanting to find additional information about it because she says her father worked with the JDC in Bricha from 1945 to 47, trying to put together this story. Um, can you, Linda, you talked about some, some of the curated collections and online exhibitions you have in the post-war period in the DP camps, but I would imagine that actually this is a, a topic when we look at the Bricha and post-war work where there's a lot of uh, possibility for conversation between the two uh, collections as well, between JDC and USHMM. Um, so I don't know who, if you want to comment, anyone. Well, since it was a question about the JDC um, in Frankfurt, actually, I, I have to say, I, I have not heard of the JDC office in Frankfurt. Um, but it seems to me that maybe there was one that I, that I'm not, that I don't. Yes. Uh, there must have been one because some of the um, departure lists that we have indexed that indicate the JDC office that originated the case um, uh, are from Frankfurt. So it was I, I a, would, a I branch would, office, yeah. a branch office, if you will. Uh -huh. So that's a more um, accurate um, answer. Um, uh, with regard to the bricha, one has to dig within our collections. A lot of the bricha work was um, uh, confidential, shall we say, and um, is not as clearly documented as uh, some of the more open activities of the joint. Um, but a scholar can uh, should be able to find material in our in in our records. Um, if you are looking for information, Daphna, about your father, um, we can try to be helpful and see what we can find. Please contact us um, uh, and we'll try to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Dion, I think uh, you, you said you had a video that you wanted to share and maybe now would be a good opportunity before we run out of time to um, preface also sort of what 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 you're sharing with us and what this um, shows about the collection as well. Thank you, Avi. Um, yeah, this is a video to show uh, the impact that research um, can have on people. So this, um, we were contacted a few uh, years ago by um, someone named Iris Tafrir. Uh, she lives in Israel. And um, Iris contacted the museum because she wanted to conduct research um, about her father, um, Yoshua Lieblich, who was a survivor. And according to Iris, um, her father was the only survivor of the family. Um, so I just want to share with you, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but I just want to share with you this family um, made video uh, that will show you the impact and uh, that will tell you much more about the discovery uh, during the research. It's a video in Hebrew and we have subtitles in English. 
באמת ספר שהמטרה של הספר זה לספר לילדים שלי מה זה אומר להיות דור שני, ובתור זה לשלב את מה שההורים שלנו עברו, ובאמת להעביר לדור הבא איך להיות עם אומץ, ובאמת להמשיך בחיים, וכל הנקודה זה לחיות. לא בעבר, אלא לחיות קדימה בעתיד. ובמשך הספר הזה אני עושה כל מיני מחקרים. והיה לי איזו סוגיה שבדקתי אותה בקשר למתי שהמשפחה נכנסה לתוך גטו קרקוב. ישבתי מול המחשב, חשבתי, הסתכלתי, בדקתי. אמרתי, מי יעזור לי, מי יעזור לי? והחלטתי לפנות למוזיאון השואה בארצות הברית. והחלטתי פשוט לשאול שאילתות על כל האחים והאחיות של, של אבא, של סבא יהושע. וקיבלתי תשובות בחזרה, ופתאום האחות הגדולה שלו, שנדליה, בתשובה שקיבלתי ממוזיאון השואה בארצות הברית, הם שולחים לי מעל חמישים מסמכים. הייתי בשוק מוחלט. אני הגעתי למייל הזה איזה יומיים אחרי זה, באיזה יום ראשון לפני שבועיים, וישבתי מ-10 מ- בלילה, אני חושב עד 2, 3 לפנות בוקר, פתאום הבנתי, אני ראיתי שם שהתוצאה של מה שכתוב שם, שיש סיכוי סביר שהאחות שלי יהושע חיה. אסף אחרי יומיים מתקשר, אומרים, תשמעו, שנדל לא נספתה בשואה, ולא רק זה, היא עלתה לארץ. אחרי זה, אחר הצהריים, הוא שולח לי תמונה של המצבה של שיינדל, הוא מתקשר אליי, אומר, תשמע, הסתכלתי בדפים שהעבירו לי חבר'ה קדישא, יש לה גם שני ילדים. בן ובת. בן ובת. הוא מקבל טלפון, וחנה יודעת שנסעתי לבקר. היא אומרת, אתה מוכרח לשמוע משהו חשוב. אמרתי, אני פה באמצע העניין, רק תשמע משפט. שלא תופתע, תכף יצלצל לך מישהו, יש לך דוד. פתאום להרגיש שיש משפחה, ולחלוק איתם את החוויות, ולזוז קדימה, ולראות שיש עתיד עם משפחה, זו חוויה אחרת לגמרי. הם יצטרפו, ואנחנו נצטרף אליהם, ונמשיך. אני מרגיש שאני גאול. So this, this shows you the impact of reuniting people. Um, it was unfortunately too late for uh, Yoshua and his sister, but um, we were able to reunite the, you know, the descendants. Uh, so that's the impact that we have on people and that's the importance of um, the conversation that Ron was talking about. Uh, it's really a conversation between people who are looking for information, whether they are family members or professional researchers, and the people who search the archives on a daily basis and to connect those collections between each other. This is really the, the importance of that conversation. Thank you, Dion. That's a, really an amazing uh, video and the, sort of this idea of bringing families together even uh, decades after the war. And we can think about how critical it is at this period of time um, right now, almost uh, 80, years, 80 years later. And I do wanna ask in that regard, so we've talked about um, research, we've talked about education, but um, can you say a little bit about, um, and maybe Dion, you can start about the interaction with the family, uh, people who are interested in doing family history research, genealogical research, um, in what ways specifically do you, do you interact with the public and provide them with guidance along these lines to find out more about, about their families? Sure, um, well, we uh, were in, constant contact with people um, via email, phone, um, or on site when we are on site. Uh, so once the museum uh, reopens our, the public space, we're going to be able to, to talk to people directly in person. And, um, and we help them uh, in many ways. I mean, most people who come to the museum and um, don't know exactly about this research services that we provide, uh, they don't even know how to ask the question. They just say, well, you know, I'm looking for information about my, my grandfather or something like this. Um, and this is, you know, we have, this is again a conversation. We have to basically ask the right questions in order to get the right answers uh, that would eventually maybe lead us to uh, the, the documentation. And um, so we search all the documents that we have at the museum and we also refer people to other institutions and the JDC is one of them. Um, we search the JDC's uh, website as well. Um, and this is really important to refer people. It's, it's basically to refer people to other uh, resources. And this is not only a conversation, it creates a real network among um, people, institutions, researchers, um, and archivists. And it, it is really a new type of 
um, relationship that we uh, we can not only develop but um, foster. And it's it's really critical to make sure that we um, we can refer people to the other researchers who work on the same subject or who know about uh, additional resources. Thank you, Dion. And, and how about on the JDC side? How do you interact with um, with researchers who are interested in collecting information on family history research or genealogy? Uh, Linda, you're you're muted. And maybe Jeff will continue. Um, we receive a great deal, uh, many many inquiries from people um, who are looking. Or information. In some cases, um, they they learn about family members who they thought had perished, um, who did. In other cases, they uh, learn something new about their family that they that they did not know. We begin with our names index and refer them there, but then um, they do, and we can help them guide them to do additional um, research in our text collections. Um, there are cases where people help us um, identify uh, individuals and photos, um, and that opens up the story. Um, we had one with the USHMM where um, USHMM had helped to preserve a particular film of the SS Mojino. Somebody saw reference to that film on the USHMM website and wanted to receive a copy of it. And we, USHMM referred them to us because we have the copyrights for the film. Uh, the person identified their mother in two different places in the film. Um, and that led us to research more in our collection and we found um, the list of all of the passengers on, the, on that ship, uh, which we shared with USHMM and, um, you know, help the family members see her, her mother on those lists as well. It's really a, a puzzle um, that we are able to help a family um, put together. And um, for this puzzle, we sometimes reach out to USHMM or other organizations to see if they may have a piece of this puzzle to help us. Jeff, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Um, no, I think that's pretty thorough. Um, just one one other uh, possibility for people um, doing this kind of family history research uh, that we try to emphasize is that we may not have something specific on your family member, but we also have uh, a great amount of information on individual towns, um, particularly towns in Poland and Ukraine. And you may not find out something about your family member, but you could learn something about what life was like in, in that town, uh, particularly in the interwar period. So that can also help enrich people's uh, of their family background. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, no, it, it really is incredible to think about the possibilities for new discoveries that can take place uh, in terms of uh, folks being able to research and find out information about their families or where they came from. Um, Abby, before I turn it over to you for closing remarks, I have one additional question that has come in um, from the Q&A, and uh, it, it comes from Greg, who asks, how does uh, JDC and the FDR library, and for that matter, I think this could apply to USHMM. How do you reach out to the community when you're in need of specific papers, artifacts, uh, or collections? And um, so I think this is a this is a question that that also addresses the the let's call it small collections um, question of of copying or digitizing or acquiring um, smaller collections that individuals may have. Um, how do you go about doing that, or if people are interested in donating to the to the museum or to JDC or the FDR library, how would they go about doing that? So um, uh, I see Linda, you have your hand up and I don't know if then this is a, and Cassandra. Okay, so go ahead, Linda, and then Cassandra. Uh, thank you, Greg, for asking this question. I probably um, haven't found enough ways uh, to publish, but we are interested 
in material that has a direct connection to the work of JDC. So that if people have um, photos or have film or have documents uh, that relate to a family member who was helped by JDC and that helps to put together that story, um, we are very, very interested. And please contact us and let us know. Um, we, we, we limit our accessions to material that really has a direct connection to our organization. Thank you. Cassandra. Sure. So I will just say that we have on our website um, information about what is in scope of our collecting mandate um, and what may fall out of scope. Uh, but I will say that it is very worthwhile for anyone who possesses material that they think may be of interest to us to reach out directly. And that can be done by emailing um, our general inbox at cura pardon me, curator at ushmm.org. Um, and it's through such inquiries that we learn about collections that provide new insight um, beyond what we might have anticipated. And one of these was a collection that was offered to the museum in the wake of Americans and the Holocaust, which revealed a trip by some 65 educators uh, from the United States to Nazi Germany in late summer 1939. It was a trip that was sponsored and facilitated by a German cultural organization. And there was a clear um, directive to identify what was going on and to report positively about that um, in such a way in the press. So it got us to think differently about how information was being imparted upon the American public. In this case, the report we were offered was from a uh, Lutheran minister who um, was originally from Germany, had been many decades in the United States, um, and he contributed to his local paper. And during the trip, his group toured Buchenwald, and he reported back in his account um, really quite negatively um, on other um, eyewitness um, and victim accounts of those who had been interned there. So it kind of provided a new insight for us about how um, public opinion in the United States at that time was being formed by Americans um, who had been sort of ported to this work. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Cassandra. And um, it seems that we are uh, out of time for this session, so I want to thank all of our panelists for a wonderful discussion and really fascinating to think about digital possibilities for the future. And um, I will turn it back over to Abby for some closing remarks. Thank you all. Thank you, Avi. Um, I just wanted to be sure that you knew about what's coming up next for the conference. Um, and invite you to continue to attend more events that we're having. So this evening, we're going to be having a film screening of the film Soul Witness, which features uh, survivor testimony. Um, and you can watch the trailer if you go to the lobby and select agenda. You can um, watch the trailer to learn more about the film to decide if you'd like to attend, but we hope that you will. Um, and I also wanted to let you know about the... Um, the sessions tomorrow morning that we hope you'll attend one of these. We have a workshop called What Did We Know? A Model for Learning Through Crowdsourced Historical Newspaper Research. And that is led by um, some folks at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as well. And then we have a session called Forced Academic Migration of Refugee Scholars, which will feature some digital humanities resources to help track the trajectories of refugee scholars um, from Europe to uh, through Europe and also to the United States. And, um, and then, of course, we have our networking tomorrow afternoon, but we'll tell you more about that tomorrow. And thank you so much for for attending. And thank you to all of our panelists and all of our attendees. And we hope to see more of you throughout the conference.